I'd like to call uh, Mr. William Chino up to the stand. Will is a self-proclaimed army brat, born in Germany, living in places such as South Korea and North Dakota. After becoming an adult, Will himself joined the U.S. Army and became a paratrooper at the age of 19. He then went on to serve 15 months in Iraq during the surge of 2007. In addition, he served another 12 months in Afghanistan. He then separated from the U.S. Army in Alaska and relocated himself to San Diego. Upon separating with the Army, William moved from Alaska to San Diego to venture in college using his GI Bill. He currently is a student at the a student at Cal State San Marcos, studying under the Global Studies program. Tonight, he'll be speaking on the media environment. So without any uh, further delay, I'd like to welcome Mr. William Chino. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is William. I'll be speaking to you tonight about the media environment. Um, my number one goal tonight is to have each and every one of you question your cable service. <laughs> like really, this is a serious question because the environment does affect us. And many prominent psychologists have even agreed that we are only 5% conscious. So what's happening to the other 95% consciousness in our brains when we are children in America that are s stuck in front of a TV just to take up some of our time? Um, this picture that you see actually came up in the midst of the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, it says it just like it is. The media is not a reflection of reality. The media does do things that have nothing to do with reality. Um, other than the media, I do want to speak to, about, speak to you about the environment, how it does affect us. Um, I'll be speaking about Dr. Bruce Lipton and Joss Garcha. Joss Garcha is from another chapter of San Diego. Um, and I want to ask the question, if the environment physically and mentally affects us, what is media doing? What is media doing to us? What is media doing to me? What are the, the basic explanation of environments affecting our genetics and behaviors uh, will be explained by Dr. Bruce Lipton um, as well. Uh, I, we are in America, and if you guys have never heard of a comedian, please go listen to a comedian. They'll drop more truth than any two-hour news show ever. Um, and that's, there's a problem there. There's a huge problem there. Um, now, this video I'm about to play is uh, a video of Dr. Bruce Lipton. Um, he did a stem cell experiment in 1967, where he took cells and he placed them in different environments. These cells are genetically the same. The only thing different is the environment. Now, just check out what, you, uh, what happens here. Can you hit the lights, please? Over 40 years ago, I was cloning stem cells, and uh, one of the first experiments just so blew my mind that it really changed the whole course of my education and my life. I put one stem cell in a culture dish all by itself, and that stem cell divides every 10 to 12 hours. After about a week to 10 days, I have thousands of cells in the Petri dish, but what's most important is all these cells are genetically identical to each other. And then what I did, and this is the experiment, I separated the, a culture of genetically identical cells into three different Petri dishes, and I changed the environment. But the culture medium to cells is like the world that we live in. It's got the air, the water, the food, all the things in it. So I had three different environments, yet genetically identical cells in each dish. And the results uh, revealed that in environment A, the cells form muscle. In environment B, the cells form bone. And in environment C, the cells form fat cells. What was so profoundly important about this is if you ask the question, what is responsible for controlling the fate of the cells? What the experiment clearly revealed was that all the cells were genetically identical. The only thing that was different from one dish to the other dish was the environment. So while at the time I was teaching medical students the conventional story out of the textbook, the concept of genetic determinism, that genes control our fate and our lives, uh, my experiments revealed a completely different story, and that was it was the environment that was primarily responsible in shaping the behavior and genetics. 
All right, that's Bruce Lipton. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's really good news that uh, I've never been heard in my whole life, and it happened before I was even born. Um, next up is Jaws Garcia. He actually explains what uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton um, was explaining in just one simple biological equation, and that's genotype plus environment equals phenotype. Now let's break this down. Genotype is your DNA, your, gene, your genes, your set genes. This is your default button. Um, the environment obviously it can be anything from the jealousy that that is uh, a, a, uh, that is in your society or uh, a scarce of foods that's in your society. And then the phenotype finally is the the end product of your physical and behavioral characteristics. So environment is the key is the key word here. Um, and what kind of environment do we live in today? Um, the environment we live in today is a media oligopoly environment. Now, if you never heard of an oligopoly, um, the, a, a simple definition would be a state of limited competition in which a market is shared by a small number of producers or sellers. Okay, simply put, when a few companies control a product or a service. It's not one, if one company were to control it, it would be a monopoly, but that's obviously illegal. But what's not illegal is oligopolies, a few companies owning. This, uh, a familiar term with other things in, in our world is a corporatocracy. This has pretty much occurred since the 1980s and has been with us. Um, now, uh, let's start with a simple example. Or excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, I'll, I'll, play, I'll play this video that explains the oligopoly real quick. It's really funny and entertaining. Hi, we're your local high-speed internet and cable provider. Are you looking for a fast, reliable internet connection? A large selection of your favorite HDTV channels? with 24-7 access to the best customer support technicians, all at a fair price? Fuck you. You'll take what we give you. You'll have the option of choosing from several of our completely unwarranted rip-offs, including internet speeds up to 200 times slower than Korea at twice the price, TV packages with over 500 channels, 90% of which you can view, and we guarantee a plethora of hidden fees. Then, our barely trained technicians will come to install your services somewhere between the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 p.m., knock once while you're in the shower, and promptly leave. And once we do finally get your service up and running, it'll be down and limping within three hours. Indefinitely. Why, you ask? Simple. We are part of what is called an oligopoly. It's like a monopoly, only legal. See, in closed door meetings with four or five of the other major providers, we've secretly agreed not to have differing prices, allowing us to completely eliminate any competition and collectively raise our prices to optimum cockbag levels. Because we here at your local high-speed internet and cable provider don't believe in customer satisfaction. We believe in money, pools of money. Looking for a better deal? You can all gobble down our balls. You're paying for it. Your local high-speed internet and cable provider. You won't like it, and there's no other option. <laughs> um, yeah, so with this said, you should be questioning where do you get your information as a little bit? How does media affect you? What kind of media are you watching or, or reading or, or experiencing? Um, is the TV your only view of the world? Uh, I've been over, I'm 28 years old, I've been over, I've been to about 12 countries, um, and this is something that um, does make you richer when you, every time you travel to another country. It's, it's really a good experience. I've met a lot of people that's never been anywhere, and I wish they could, and I know it's because of financial reasons, or their, their days are too busy. Um, but moving on. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with an example of oligopoly with some of the brands we are familiar with. Um, if you walk into any gas station, they should have pretty much every single brand here. Um, these brands are, are, are uh, grouped, as you can see, um, like maybe you would have not known that Tropicana, a juice company, was owned by Pepsi. Or uh, Nestle provided um, um, a mother's milk in Africa. Uh, and like it, it's, it's really crazy what they produce. It's like, what is a milk company producing um, something crazy like, I don't know, candy bars? And I don't, it shouldn't go together, honestly. Um, but for media oligopolies, this is the media oligopolies. Um, as of last year, people found out that 90% of American media is owned through the six companies, these six companies. You have General Electric, it's a huge media company, um, News Corp. Time Warner, Viacom. 
And I want, now I want to take you about how the media affects us. Uh, Marshall McLuhan is a very famous philosopher of communi communication theory. Um, he basically said the media physically affect the human ne uh, nervous system. They influence the way the brain works and how it processes information. They create new patterns of thought and behavior. Um, Theodore Ordono is a German sociologist. Uh, he explains it as the culture industry produces mindless entertainment and provides great social, political, and economic importance. Why? Such entertainment can distract audiences from critical thinking, sapping time and energy from social and political action. Does this sound familiar? Um, Catherine Sarikakis, I believe, is a communication professor, and this is really important. Um, she says, the normative framework necessary for the legitimization of policies that transform the media across Europe redefine the public in its relation to the media as consumers of media services and accumulators of cultural goods rather than members of an informed active citizenry. To sum it up, Jack Lowell sums everything up I just talked about in his book, Globalization and Media. People are encouraged to think of products, not politics. They are consumers, not citizens. Transnational media conglomerates have little incentive to invest in local talk shows, news channels, documentaries, or other social and political contact. The global oligopoly of media thus creates, helps create a passive, apolitical populace that rises from the couch primarily for consumption. Now, uh, he also explains uh, three huge influences a media oligopoly would have on public affairs, excuse me, public affairs reporting or international reporting. Um, one would be the oligopoly's single-minded interest in profits results in mass content rather than local content. Most, profit, excuse me, most profitable content is mass-produced, published, and broadcast widely and simultaneously in numerous countries. Two, cheap productions. Most profitable content is inexpensive, non-labor intensive, and easy to produce. Local news shows, investigative reporting, and documentaries are expensive. And three, News has become softer, lighter, and less challenging. The most profitable con content will be escapist and apolitical. News and political content can upset and divide the population, drive away viewers, and displease authorities. Foreign news bureaus are expensive, training international journalists are expensive, and international travel is expensive. The media oligopolies drive for profits, profits thus leads to mass produce cheap escapist apolitical content with little interest in or incentive for actual news. So if you ever wonder why the media is not telling you what you really want to know, it's because that's not their concern. Their concern is making money. Now, if you guys haven't, aren't aware, there was a Boston Marathon bombing, um, I guess a terrorist act. Um, now, how did the media act on this? I recently listened to an NPR segment um, called On the Media. You could look it up on the media.org. What that what they do is actually they they go they do stories on other media companies, how the media is treating actual events in our society. And here <laughs> here's a perfect example of what the media has done. So if you see at eleven o'clock Fox confirms arrest of suspect in Boston uh, marathon bombings. And Thirty minutes later it obviously changed. Now the media is doing their job. Every time they do get news they are posting it up to us, right? But the problem, and the, the, the example with the Boston Marathon bombing is that every single media company was reporting something different. You had to pick your own conclusion. You really had to. And with that said, they're saying, and every single media company has a different government source. So where are they getting their, so, so where are these government officials coming from? Um, I have a history teacher right now, actually, and since I am a veteran of the Iraq War, this affected me deeply. But I did find out that my teacher, while he was studying his PhD in Oxford, he was writing about Saddam Hussein and his regime and the weapons of mass destruction. Now, what's so important about what he wrote is that his information was used to justify the invasion of Iraq. It was plagiarized by Tony Biller and Colin, per or Colin Powell. Literally plagiarized. Now, now, what does this tell us? Do governments really have the information that we really kind of expect them to have? Do they have more secretive, more important information than we do? Obviously not. They justified a whole war on the research of a PhD student. And this is, and, and here's another thing. You won't find this on a major mainstream media site. You'll find this on crack.com. This is the type of media environment we live in. 
And, and here, here's the article, five clues hidden in computer files that can get you busted. Number five, Word document reveals that the Iraq invasion was based on a plagiarized college essay. <laughs> Did I really risk 15 months of my life on some bullshit media story? What really happened? Does anybody here even know why we, why we went there, what happened, what's going on now? Do you even know that there's 50,000 troops still in Iraq? The war is supposed to be over? Was it about the war or was it about the reconstruction of a country? Yeah. Well, I mean, what, was it about oil? I mean, really, it's, I was there. I have a couple friends here that were there too. We lost friends there. For what? Something that I, for 19 years, 20, 25 years of my life, I believed in? I think it's, it's, it's complete bullshit. I'd like you to wake up. Waking up may not be as cool as going to the bar every weekend. Like, it may not be. But if you just stop and think about it, you can influence other people. You can start doing things differently. You don't have to sit down at five o'clock when you get off of work just to watch TV, because your, your, your life is so boring. Get up and do something. We have the internet. The internet has all the information in the world that we need, but we argue about cat pictures. <laughs> What's wrong with this country, world? Everything we know of. So with that said, Maybe I did convince you to question your cable service. Thank you.